Um, so, so welcome to today's uh, webinar. Uh, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce Senha Ho, who's an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. So he did his PhD with Long Nagun and uh, Yurikov Ritov at the University of Michigan, and then did a postdoc at Berkeley, where he worked with uh, people including Michael Jordan and Martin Wainwright. And so he's been very productive and he's worked on a, on a wide range of uh, problems at the interface between statistics and machine learning, uh, including high dimensional regression, mixtures of experts, uh, deep learning, mm -hmm. uh, including variational autoencoders, transformers, mm -hmm. uh, convolutional mm -hmm. neural networks. Um, so he's also worked a lot on, uh, on Gaussian mixture models, and mm -hmm. uh, that's what he's going to be talking about today. So I'll, I'll hand over to Enhan now. Thank Jim for the introduction. Um, so the talk I uh, give today is also about like Gaussian mixture models, uh, but uh, based on uh, some new insights about how to understand uh, the behaviors of parameters, right? basically how when we estimate the latent variables uh, in these models by using the uh, uh, some kind of like a variant of what's that metric. And basically we try to uh, generalize what is that metric to the Olic space? Uh, Olic space is like a very useful uh, notion in um, mathematics, but it turns out that uh, we can use that uh, with the what's that metric to improve the understanding of like the contraction of the uh, extra uh, uh, components in the uh, infinite algebraic mixture models, or like when we have a digital process mixture model, right? So, um, to motivate like how we use like the Olic uh, norm to the what's time metric. I, I also try to, uh, let's go back to the uh, previous results when we only use what's time metric on the Gaussian mixture models and see uh, the issues of the distances uh, and then uh, how we can resolve sub issues by using the Olic's what's time metric. And this is based on uh, like, like uh, my collaboration with like uh, Arija Guha, which is uh, was a uh, PhD student at Blanc, um, but now he uh, a, a scientist at AT and T Research, and is also with my uh, previous advisor Longwing, which is at the Michigan now. <clears throat> okay, before I uh, talk about theory, I also want to give uh, a brief uh, like uh, introduction about applications of. Gaussian mixture models. Uh, I guess uh, I have everyone here familiar with like Gaussian mixture models, but I also want to emphasize that uh, this model have been used uh, a lot nowadays in uh, computer vision, like how we actually do image clustering, image generation, image annotation, or like how we can actually perform like lab language models, like how can we actually uh, teach the AI machine to uh, make prediction uh, to like somehow like to um, uh, perform like speech recognition and so on. And it's also very useful in astronomy when you want to perform like object detection, when you want to uh, study about the noise and signal and so on. Maybe like where is the star, right? And how can we actually uh, distinguish a star from the noise? Right? So these models have been used uh, wise a lot in these applications. And in more details, for example, like uh, recently, these models have been used in deep generative models. So for, by deep generative model, I mean that we try to understand the high dimensional data distribution, let's say of images, of like words, of speech, and so on. So for these problems, the challenge is about high dimensional, uh, like uh, uh, with high dimension, because uh, the traditional tools that we have from, let's say, uh, uh, Bayesian parametrics become uh, very expensive. Right? Then uh, people oppose using uh, deep net, deep neural networks, and some of like, but most popular one is based on using like the variational auto encoder, iterative adversarial networks, and balancing flows, and diffusion models in recent time. Diffusion models now become like the most um, like, uh, like impressive uh, models for performing deep generative models. 
and it was widely used in industry to like somehow uh, generate a uh, shape and uh, generate like a uh, high resolution image. But then uh, it's still with the models like they are actually white black box. That's why I mean like we actually, it's very hard for us to interpret the like the results from these models because they relies on using deep learning models. Right? But why in our like our, our work, we basically try to propose uh, as basically some way to um, interpret uh, these models. And that's why we introduced the, the, the convolutional uh, generative models, but basically just like a deep Gaussian mixture models where the location is essentially a convolution neural networks. Okay. And we basically try to explain uh, how the uh, like deep learning components like the uh, activation and also the uh, max pooling, these operators in like uh, the convolution neural networks uh, actually work in uh, actually like when we learn image. So see that we have broad examples how we can use a deep picture uh, models for uh, generating uh, like complex and high dimensional data. Another one that I also want to mention is uh, about like the chat GPT, right? Something that people um, are also very impressive about AI nowadays. The idea is that uh, we somehow uh, use, we somehow like uh, know that chat GPT somehow can perform a very uh, impressive, uh, uh, can have very impressive performance uh, when we ask them like some questions, right? And they also can learn about uh, our questions and so on, right? But then behind uh, their performance is uh, a very famous and self the art deep learning architecture, which is a transformer. So it, it was introduced by uh, Google uh, in 2017. And only after six years, uh, it's become like the most important deep learning architectures in our most uh, on applications uh, in language, public vision, and machine learning. And it's also like the key uh, backbone of Latin language models like ChatGPT and so on. But then uh, the issue with the uh, like the transformers over there is it basically very expensive, and because we need to compute like let's say uh, multiple layers, and in these layers we also have like several nonlinear um, like uh, like nonlinear layers, I mean, nonlinear uh, operators, and so to improve like the efficiency of like a transformer. We also utilize uh, picture models right, to somehow like uh, improve like the readiness, improve the uh, reduced number of parameters that we can use in these models. So basically, we can use like uh, mixture model, Gaussian mixture models of both like uh, image and language, right? But then uh, there, even though we can use that model for like improving deep learning models. But they actually still like uh, have a lot of issues. So I basically try to group, uh, actually try to list uh, the issue into four main directions. The first one is about heterogeneity, meaning like how can we understand about the latent structures of data, right? And the second one is how can we interpret uh, the models when we misspecify the models, right? And the third and fourth. And the third and fourth direction is about like optimization or like sampling. So how can we guarantee that the optimization and the sampling methods are robust and also have like a poly polynomial tab? I mean that, how can we guarantee that they are robust and efficient? Because now we have a very deep uh, like uh, structures. Right? So um, I mean, basically uh, these uh, four directions are like, in my opinion, are important. And today we uh, only focus on the first topics, which is the uh, how to actually understand the behaviors of latent structures. Right? And one thing that important about this model that I haven't emphasized so far is that we usually over parameterized or like over specified the number of parameters of these models. If for example, like we never know the true number, the true model complexity. Right? And most of the time we basically um, over parameterized. For example, like we have uh, the Dirichlet process picture models when we actually using a Dirichlet process prior, like right, on the parameters. And 
that model can be like too rich for all the data. I mean that we have like more parameters than we need for uh, fitting the uh, data. And then we also have like the models that uh, I just introduced for like niche generative models and for transformer. All of the examples, basically we use a, a lot of parameters, right? To somehow fit the data. And one question is using that many parameters in like Gaussian mixture models, does it have any effect on the uh, heterogeneity of data? That's why uh, we try to focus uh, on understanding the effect of like over parameterization on the uh, latent structures. So here is, is an outline of my talks. Uh, first, I try to uh, basically <coughs> introduce what's a style metric and how it can be used to understand about the behaviors of the parameter estimation in Gaussian mixture models. Then I also highlight some limitations of that distance in uh, understanding parameter estimation. Then based on the insight that we have for the limitation, we also introduce the OLEX what's a style metric to somehow like uh, reduce, uh, somehow like overcome some of the limitations of system metric where we try to estimate the extra components in Gaussian mixture models. Then I also give high level insight about how we can um, like achieve the uh, polynomial, polynomial time for estimating the extra components in uh, the all parameterized Gaussian mixture models. So before we go to like the core uh, theoretical results, I also want to give like some notation. I mean, like how we define Gaussian mixture models. So some that we have data, we have like n data, right? Come from like uh, a mixture of k zero, right? Of like Gaussian distribution. Okay, and we have like p i and t i here stand for the mixing weight and the mixing components. And theta i here can be talked as location and the uh, variant and covariant matrix of the Gaussian distribution. And also here, the numbers of uh, like a cluster of components, k0 here, is usually unknown. So these uh, mixing weight, mixing components, and the numbers of components k0 somehow capture the latent structures of data. That's why if you want to understand about the heterogeneity of data, we want to understand how to estimate the parameters. Or like in, um, I, but then in like a summary, we actually want to estimate uh, a mixing measure, T0, that I actually uh, write over there. Consists of like PIs at the weight of that mixing measures and TIs is the, the mixing components of that. So we basically like uh, turn the problem of estimating the parameters into the problem of estimating uh, probability measures where we have the mixing weight and mixing components uh, of that uh, measures stand for the, those from the uh, mixture models. So now we actually care about how we can recover, how can we can uh, estimate the two mixing measures G0 so uh, there are actually three approaches to somehow like estimate the two uh, mixing measures. The first one is by, based on uh, over specify over specifying the two models. Uh, it means that we over amortize the models by multiple uh, more components. For example, like we have we can have like only three uh, components, but we actually fit by one thousand components. Right? And this approach was uh, what popular because it is that expensive. We don't need to perform any model selection and it's actually why uh, good for the computation. But then uh, by using that over, uh, over parameterization, then we also have issues with the uh, slow behaviors of parameters that I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. And then uh, we also have another approach where we try to perform like model selection, right? either by using like e BIC uh, or like by using the separations of model parameters and the values of mixing weight to somehow like reduce the number of components and then help that it can, it can estimate the two uh, number of components. And finally, we also have a Bayesian parametric approach 
based on using like, let's say, usually process. And it's also like the focus that we try to uh, understand today. We try to say that we can using, we can use like uh, a variant of what's the metric to understand the uh, behaviors of extra components in Dirichlet like, process Gaussian mixture models. But then uh, regardless of what we uh, use, a plus one, two or three, essentially uh, we basically can use watch the metric to somehow capture the, the rate uh, of the estimation right, to the to mixing measure. And in case that you're not familiar with the watch the metric, then I also write down the definitions below. The idea is that if you have two probability measures, let's say we have like the two mixing measures T0 and another one with ID notes by G, then mm -hmm. that this is basically trying to measure, uh, try to capture the minimal cost of moving the uh, support of G to T0 and vice versa. And here we have like the constraint that uh, the way to move like the, the support of like T to T0 should be uh, satisfied that this is basically a chunk distribution between T to T0. So basically previous studies demonstrate that by using watch time metric, we're able to understand about the behaviors of parameter estimation in uh, either like uh, approach one, like when we actually over parameterize model or by approach three, when we actually use the like, usually process picture models on like the models. Uh, uh, on the uh, estimation models. So basically this metric is very like uh, universal and bow uh, and very powerful. And uh, but then it turns out that uh, by using that metric, we can prove that like, for example, like if we have finite settings, when you have only finite number of components, then if we somehow like uh, know about the true number of components, then the rate is parametric under the first order what's the metric and some here we have emulate, right, for example. But then when we over parameterize or over specify the models by K components, let's say we have three components, but we pick by five, then the rate of the estimation become uh, N to the minus one divided by two R bar. And the R bar here is the smallest possible values uh, that the system of polynomial equations that I write below over there doesn't have any no trivial solution. So for a system equation that I wrote over there, then we basically have uh, AJ, BJ, CJ are the unknown variables. You can think of CJ as the mixing weight, AJ is here as the uh, mixing location, and BJ is a the mixing variance. So we use CJ, AJ, and BJ here to understand about the mixing weight location and variance in the over uh, specified Gaussian mixture models. And we speak argue that by solving that system, right, we have an R equation, R over there. That by solving like R system equa R system, R equations in the system, and if we want to guarantee that we don't have any non-trivial solution, I mean that all the parameters are non-zero, then we need to have a very large values of R. That's why we can have R bar over there. For example, like if we only uh, over specify the model by one component, then the R bar is four, right? So being that the rate that we estimate the parameters become very slow comparing to the case when we know the number of components. Here I actually also like give examples of like that system. Uh, and we basically uh, can demonstrate that R bar is four when we have uh, one extra component and the values of R bar is six when we have two extra components and then the value become very large when we have more than three components. And my conjecture and our conjecture is that the values of R bar is two times the amount that we over specify the Gaussian mixture models. So it means that the more we over specify the Gaussian mixture models, the slower the rate uh, that we want to estimate the to mixing measure. It means that in practice, we need to be very careful when we over specify the number of components in these models.
But it means that if we actually have like a traditional like a uh, process mixture a uh, process gas mixture models, then we got case basically in infinity. It means that we basically can suffer from the log n one divided by log n rate by of, es of estimating the the two mixing measures, and this is also like already uh like study like previously, and we know that this is the case when we have like like an infinite location gas mixture models. Basically, that also the result from uh, uh, like uh, long papers in 2013. Basically, uh, he demonstrated that by using a second order process dimetric, if we have uh, an, uh, a Dirichlet process Gaussian uh, mixture models with our location, okay, we fix the covariant matrix, then we need to have like one divided by log n uh, to the power of one half to estimate the true mixing measure. And this result basically means that uh, we somehow uh, uh, mean that I mean the slow rate here basically mean because we have so many extra components. I mentioned earlier, right? When we have too many extra components, then the values of R bar go to infinity, and that's why using a Dirichlet process uh, using a Dirichlet process priors on the uh, missing measures uh, can be a bit like problematic for the estimations of a two mixed measure. But then we want to see like how the under, how the convergence under the metric can translate to the uh, the mixing parameters and mixing weight because these are something that we care about. So let's say we can prove that the convergence rate of the parameters is omega n under the R order of the metric. Then we can show that the components like the location and the scale parameters of the MLE, we can roll to uh, those of the two mixing measures at the same rate, omega n. This means that uh, if we know the rate is like n to the minus one eight, then it also means location scale also can roll at the same rate to the two parameters. Or like if we have like the rate to be one divided by log n, like what we have for the uh, layer process, especially mixture models, it's also translated to the one by log n to the location and scale parameters. And then we also have the extra weight right, of the right, of the uh, of the uh, of the estimators convert to zero at the rate over again to the R. Right? So let's say if we have a traditional process mixture model and and we use like second order or metric, that has been that the extra components that we have in the Dirichlet process picture models, we can reverse zero at the rate one in five by log n. Right? So mean that we need to have like exponential number of data in order to estimate uh, these extra components. Right? So it means that uh, if we actually basically have like, uh, we actually basically have like a Dirichlet process picture models, then the implication to the parameters and to the mixing weight are on way uh, at the order supply one divided by block n, up to some order. So it's basically mean that it's always very slow. Somehow it's mean that we have a very like a negative result because it means if we were actually want to use like a Dirichlet process mixture model to estimate, to understand the latent structures, then we need to have exponential number of data. Right? But then somehow that we I mean the result can be negative, right? especially for those who are using the Dirichlet uh, process picture models in the applications. But it turns out that even we have slow rate, then we can still use these slow rate of parameters to choose to perform line model selection. So the idea is that we can merge the flow components of like estimators based on the rate, or like we truncate the edge components of estimators, and then we merge them to their those components also based on the rate of convergence. And we demonstrate that when the sample size is sufficiently large, then that much truncate most procedures based on the rate of the uh, mixed components and missing weight going to give us a consistent estimate of the two number of components. So that's somehow like a very nice result because it means that even we have slow rate, we can still perform some like force processing with the estimators to guarantee that we have uh, like Good model selection, right? 
but then uh we got that one but there's still one thing because uh the result that we have from the uh, a uh, process um as mission models basically uh only global you know there was the magic that we have uh, on globals I mean that it's basically say on the components that we have uh have a slow rate right because the watch time metric have slow rate also mean that all the components have slow rate based on the indications that I just mentioned. However, that's too pessimistic because in practice, there are actually components that have much faster conversion rate than those from the watch time metric. And also the extra weight that I mentioned earlier, uh, when we're using like, the second order watch time metric, basically imply the one divided by log n rate, right? Which is like very negative for clustering purpose. And if you go back to like this, uh, like much truncate much procedures, because we actually perform that based on the rate. And if omega n here is a one divided by log n, then it means that we need to have a lot of data, right? In order to perform that uh, model selection, which can be very expensive. It means that we want to improve this low rate if it's actually better, right? So in the finite uh, mixture settings, it's been that when the number of components is finite and we only use like a finite number of components to over specify the models, then we actually demonstrate that we can use a foreign noise based metrics to somehow improve the rate of the individual parameters and weight uh, comparing to those for what's the metric. But then uh, in the case when you have, when we have a Dirichlet process mixture models, then we can develop a new version of what's the metric based on generalizing the traditional Euclidean norms in what's the metric based on the OLEX norms. That's why we have the OLEX what's the distance. And we, we only focus on uh, OLEX what's the distance. And in case you actually interest on about like the foreign noise based metrics and how it can improve the results for what's the metric, I also include a paper over there. Right? Okay, so now uh, I will talk about like how we can use like the OLEX numbed it was slightly distant to improve the rate of the edge components in these models. And I mentioned this is also based on the chart work of my advisor, uh, Long, and also my college, uh, Agi Chaguha, which uh, was uh, which actually a research scientist now at AT and T AI team. So the idea is that. Uh, we basically, I mentioned, we actually try to incorporate the OLEC nodes into what's the metric. So in order to do that one, I also want to introduce a sum of notation. So let's say we have a universal assumption, not the one. We basically uh, introduce uh, some conditions for a convex function um, because we want to generalize the, uh, the uh, Euclidean norm, right? That's why we want also uh, some class of functions, a convex function. And in our case, we uh, consider only a convex function phi, a positive one. That's such that the phi x divided by x go to infinity when x go to infinity. And phi x divided by x go to zero when x goes to zero. Basically that we have the condition on the tail behaviors of the convex function and also um, how it's actually concentrates when uh, x go to zero. Then we also define the all ex, all ex space. But the idea is basically like we try to define L phi to be on a function f, right? Such that the integral of that phi of uh, absolute values of fx divided by k to the Lebesgue measure, let's say Lebesgue, Lebesgue measures, that's equal to one, right? For some case. Basically, like, I mean, that if we consider the traditional like Euclidean norm, like let's say the phi here is just like the x squared. The standard L2 norm, then the only norms that we have below, right? The minimum values of K such that the integral of uh, the above term here, less than one, right? Then if we have like P to be like, just like a polynomial X square I mentioned, that it become the standard L2 norm. Or like if we actually consider like a polynomial um, of X to the R, then the uh, only norm become like the standard LR norm, right? In that we use. So it, this means that the all the terms over there is a generalization of the Euclidean norm 
or like L L L P norm that we usually have. And the reason that we care about that polyp norm because we want to somehow capture better the behaviors of the uh the extra components right in Jewish like positive models. And that's why we want to incorporate something like exponential function, not just the polynomial function, into the way we define what's the metric. That's why now if you try to somehow uh, uh, introduce that olix space and olix norms to uh, capture that generalization. And then based on the olix space and olix norm, we also can define the corresponding all it was a time metric between two probability measures. The idea is that basically we just plug in right the all term into the what's the metric. That's why we still have we have two loops, we have two minimization problems. The first one is a standard one from optimal trend from like what's the metric. We try to find the best way to move right, the spot uh, from two measures. But then for the second optimization, it's come from the all it norms. Right. We try to find the best uh, K to somehow guarantee that the integral inside actually less than to one. Right? And we can guarantee that, we can demonstrate that <clears throat> when Vx here is just like <clears throat> actually are, then the all it was the metric become like the standard was the metric of order R between two measures. And we also can demonstrate that the all equals the metric is a proper metric on the uh, space of probability measures. It means that it's a metric satisfy the identity metrics and also triangle inequalities. So it means that this is then basically uh, very nice because it's basically similar to a uh, what is the metric uh, that we usually use when we have only Euclidean distance. And there's also a couple of properties that make a distance very uh, useful. The first one is that uh, the all equals time metric is an increasing function. So what do we mean by that? It's mean that if we have two convex functions, phi and size, right? satisfy the uh, assumption about the tail behaviors, and somehow uh, phi is all way uh, lower than the size function, then we can demonstrate that the values, the olix uh, was the metric uh, with the psi function, sorry, with the phi function is only less than equal to the olix was the metric of the psi function. And this means like if we have a linear combinations of like two function, then it's only uh, somehow like the olix, right? The like linear combinations of like two olix was the metric of two function is only up about it by what's the metric of the max of uh, all equals the metric of the max of the two functions. And this uh, property here is very useful later when we try to establish the contraction rate of the parameters in the traditional approach picture models. And the second one, which also the key properties uh, that distinguish that from the traditional Euclidean what's the metric is it's able to quantify correctly the behaviors of the extra components in the dish layer process picture models. So what do we mean by that? So let's say we have like uh, G here in the mixing measures. Let's say we have like infinite numbers of, of like components, I mean like K infinite, let's say. And then the two mixing measures with K zero components. So let's say K infinite and K zero finite. And we know from the previous result that if we have infinite number of components to fit to the final number of components, then we have one of a block n, right? right? If we use like the standard what's the metric uh, with Euclidean distance. However, if we actually like consider using the olix norm to the what's the metric, then the left-hand side of the inequality below doesn't mean that the behaviors, right? The summation of the weight of the edge components, right? And the right-hand side is the array of these components. And so we have one divided by the convex function phi. Uh, then also inside we have the eta right, divided by the all its process time metric between the two measures, right? So it's been that and eta here is the gap between like the edge components to the real, uh, to the two components. So it means that if we somehow choose phi here to be like exponential function, 
then and we can guarantee that uh, when we demonstrate that the uh, all this was symmetric with the fee here somehow log n let's say then even that one we still have the a polynomial rate because the exponential of log n right still like a polynomial function right that's why if we actually able to somehow use like exponential function for phi we able to get the parent a polynomial rate for edge components right so it means that we basically improve uh, the rate from like one divided by log n of the extra components when we use Watson metric with the Euclidean norm to like something like polynomial rate, something much faster, right? By using the like, exponential function for phi, right? And that's also mean that uh, if we're able to establish the posterior rate for the mixed measures and the all equal Watson metric with the exponential distribution, exponential function for phi then we basically able to get the polynomial rate for the extra components. And this is very important because it can help us to improve the merge and k-merge procedure that earlier, right? When we only we reduce from one of a block n to like only polynomial rate between the extra components. Yeah. But then a uh, the question like, how can we really compute, right? Because now we have that complex uh, two optimization, right? One over the tonal distribution of two measures and one over uh, some like a, a K, right? Like, but then this K actually needs to satisfy the constraint on the integral, right? So it means that we have a very complex optimization problems. And basically the question is, how can we compute that all the question that distance efficiently? So if we talk about like traditional what's the metric, then the best possible computation is all k square, where k here is the numbers of spot, right, of the mixing measures. And that uh, all k square can be achieved by using the entropic regularization approach, right? So this is basically the best possible uh, computation, right, complexities that we can have for approximating what star distance when you have, when we have like Euclidean distance, let's say. And now we top that we can, and now we try to adapt this idea to also improve the efficiency of computing the op all the cross star distance. So the idea is that we introduce uh, an extra uh, entropy of the uh, transition distribution between the two mis uh, mis missing measures. So you, you will see the, 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 like the definitions of A, V, nu one, nu two, and in this, in this one, somehow we introduce that one divided by uh, lambda times the entropies right, of the uh, nu, right? This is actually the entropic regularization that I mentioned earlier, right? By introduce that regularization into the all equal metric, then we can demonstrate that we, uh, we can somehow perform like the binary search to somehow compute that distance. So I try to skip that one because uh, I may be high the time. So, but then the idea of that algorithm one is that we can compute the all equal star metric between two probability measures in uh, or with only the complexities of all k square, right? The case here is the uh, numbers of components of each missing measures, right? And here we also have like some simulations uh, to compute like the all equal star metric between two Gaussian models, okay? Sorry, two mixture models. The first one is like three components, um, like Gaussian mixture models, and the second one is like uh, four components, Laplacian uh, uh, mixture models. And on the left hand side, we have like the uh, the plant, right? Meaning the optimal uh, the transfer the transfer plant the transfer plant from the uh, first order was symmetric, and for the right hand side, we have the uh, transfer plant right from the all equal star metric with exponential function phi. So you see that the one from the standard was metric, we have a very dense, right? uh, we have very dense matrix. On the other hand, for the for the one on the right hand side, we have actually white sparse one, and it actually has some kind of like local behaviors. Right? So somehow like it tried to get to the uh, the closest one. Right? I mean each component try to get to the closest one, and the, it's mean that all the uh, procedures tend to produce sharper uh, 
transfer plans comparing to the standard or standard metric, right? And especially mean that uh, that kind of like sharper behaviors but potentially can be useful for clustering behavior and all like robust uh, applications. And this is also what we are investigating right now. But then like, if now we go back to the theory, we now we know that we can computing the all the cross-time metric in a very efficient way. The next question is, uh, how can we use that distance to get the, uh, improve the rate for the edge components I mentioned earlier? So it means that we, need, we have some assumption about like the allocation to be on compact space. And then the convex function fee also uh, less than equal to some exponential of actual beta minus one. So this is like the assumption that we have for like both location parameters and for also for the convex function in the all space in on all across the metric. A key result is like from like Goshan Van der Vaart is like uh, we always have the rate n to the plus one divided by one plus d for the uh, for the like estimation of density function. Right? So it means that if we somehow can establish the low bound of the handling distance between the mixing densities function into by the all equal metric between the mixing measures, then we are able to get the posterior projection rate of the uh, mixing measures under the uh, all equal metric. And we actually can demonstrate that by using, under the assumption of the phi, uh, of a convex function phi, and also of the parameters, then we can up about the all equal metric of the two mixing measures in terms of like, uh, like the three terms that we have either on the right hand side in the theorem two. But then you can ignore like the second and third terms. Sorry, you can ignore like the first and the second terms and only focus on the third terms. And basically mean that eventually uh, we can up about the all equal metric between two mixing measures in terms of like one divided by log of one divided by the hand system between mixing, mixing density function uh, to the power of one half, right? Is the one I'm the one I write below. That's either the bound we have for this case. And this, this results hold for a wide range of phi because we already need phi x to be at exponential of x p minus one. It means that it's whole not only for polynomial, but also for exponential function. Really, what's something we care about, right? I guess like, I don't have much time, right? Right now, right, Jim, right? I don't have much time, right? How much time I have left, Tim? Well, I mean, no, like five, 10 minutes, okay? Okay, so uh, I guess I will briefly mention the proof and go to implication, okay? So basically let me know that now we have that results, but then how can we get, uh, like, how, how can we get there? What's the, what's the principle behind that results? So the idea of the proof is that we try to decompose the audit or standard metric between two mixing measures based on three terms. Uh, the first one is when we comp we actually do convolution of the mixing measure G with a kernel K, right? K delta D over there, where K delta D is the products of all number K delta. And each K delta is defining uh, in the following form below, okay? And how can we get this form? I'm going to explain next slide, okay? Basically now we actually, we try to uh, comp make convolution of the missing measure to some kernel, k delta c d, right? And we create three terms. And we try, we try to control like the three terms. Uh, and then we can go back to the bow for the, the all equal metric. So the reason that we choose that particular kernel, k delta x, that we have this form here, the form over there, is because we want the Fourier transform right, of that kernel over there, k delta to be somehow like up about by exponential of the minus x to the four, right? Basically, it's been that the way we decide that kernel E because we want to have that exponential of minus x to the four is up about that Fourier transform that, of the kernels, okay? And then based on that one, we can demonstrate that if we uh, somehow like uh, make a convolution of basic measures with the kernel K delta D, especially the products of all the kernels in one dimension, then if as long as the convex function phi is at the orders of exponential of some constant time, actually alpha minus one, where alpha is from one to the four to five by three, then we can bound the what's the time metric 
between G and G star K delta D and G0 and G0 star K delta D it's of like some constant time delta, right? It means that we have a linear bound it of delta for these uh, all equation symmetric between G and G's uh, convolution with like K delta D and G0 and G0 convolution with K delta D. And the assumption on phi basically uh, where only when the powers of X come from one to one body, right? And the idea is that that one is based on also the Fourier transform again of function exponential, but it's actually four, right? Which is, I mean, the phi t times exponential of some constant times the absolute values of t to the power of 45 three. And that's how we get that constraint of alpha in lemma three. Okay? And it's also how we actually uh, design the kernel in the, in the, in the, in the first line. Then based on that one, we know that we can bound the original all equal symmetric, which is Jupiter measures into delta plus the uh, all equal symmetric between the two convolution, right, of G and G0. Then, but then to control the all equal symmetric between the two convolutions, uh, it becomes, if actually harder than all the two terms. And, uh, but then one key inside that we can somehow reduce that What's the system, uh, all equal symmetric between the G2 convolution into like uh, the integral in the lemma four, okay? Basically mean that we can move the difference between like the two convolution, I mean, into like the, the TV, uh, the, total variation, the total variation tie up like about, right? That mean that now we can somehow like just focus on the tie up like the right-hand side inequalities when we try to control the uh, all equal symmetric between the two convolution. And for that, for, and for that uh, integration right, over there, then we also decompose into two areas of the integrals. One is when the norm of X is at most M, and one is when the norm of X is uh, bigger than M. And we can basically uh, demonstrate that for the case when the norm of X is at most M, then we can help the about at the end of the slide by like m divided by some things okay and then when the case when we actually have enough x i mean greater than m then we can demonstrate that we can control it one by like uh one divided by m to the one by four plus uh c times delta five by four okay so the proof here actually why a bit more complex that's why i only mentioned the results if you actually somehow into the like the, the results, you also take a look at the paper uh, for more detailed proof. So combines of all of these uh, bound together, it means that we can bound the all the what is symmetric between G to zero in terms uh, of the functions of delta, right, and big M, right, and we try to perform like an optimization with phi, with delta, sorry, with the delta and and big M to somehow uh, determine like. The dependencies of that on the heading distance. When we did demonstrate that the choice of M and delta that we have over there somehow give us like a most like optimal values, right? And look in this value into like the function of delta and M up there, we got the conclusion of two. Okay. So this basically the idea is like we try to break the uh, all the symmetric between the mixing measure into Multiple distance, uh, multiple distances of uh, convolution, and we control these uh, terms. In summary, based on that results, we can demonstrate that if we have the uh, GHD process, asymmetric models with only location, then we the all equal symmetric between like uh, I mean the contractions of like the missing measures is one divided by log n, right, to about one divided by eight, right. Basically, this is the result. And the contractions of the mixing measures, so the contractions of the extra components, right, from the results is only exponentials of minus log n to the one eight. So it means that the contractions of the mix of the extra components now become polynomial, right? Comparing to like uh, the uh, one divided log n earlier from the uh, Western metric, right? And we also have some remarks on the results. First thing is that uh, because now we have the Contraction rate one is five by log n to the power of one by eight, right? Under the olic what's the distance comparing to like one is five by log n to one half when we use like 
the Euclidean distance are uh, with or symmetric. So it means that for the rate of density function, we some for the rate of this measure, sorry, under uh, no, all equal symmetric, we actually have a speed slower. But then this is because we don't choose uh, uh, the best option of phi. And we conjecture that we can use that phi x to have to be like exponential of x squared minus one to improve the rate to back to like one and five n to one half. But that requires a new group technique and it's beyond the talk today. And then also like, I, I, I mentioned earlier, then we now we have an almost a polynomial rate, right? For the edge components, comparing to like the, uh, like one different block end rate when we have only the time metric, right? So it means that the all equal time metric somehow get us a better, more precise pictures about the uh, edge components in the Dirichlet proximity models. But then there's still some limitations of the all equal star metric, such as it's not able to improve the rate, right? For components in the areas of two components. I mean that now it's only give us like a tie behavior for the edge components, right? But not the one in converge to the two components, right? So some components may still have biometric rate. It's been that we are not able to capture like, the biometric rate right now for some components. Right, where it actually can where it actually can to the two components. And it also doesn't use like improved rates for components outside the areas of two components, right? When the uh, kernels that we use like is like a blast, right? like we have like that black feature models, then we don't do we don't have any improvement in terms of the rate comparing to like the traditional cost metric. At least are the two limitations that we have when we use like other cost metric. But then at the end of the day, we're able to show that right, we can uh, improve the rates for the extra components, but we still are able to capture on of the uh, correct, uh, on the rate of all the components. Um, and this also doesn't give any improved rate for the case when uh, the kernel is not very smooth. Right? That's why we, I try to highlight three directions in the hub to address the limitations. The first one, like somehow hope that we can develop some kind of like a foreign noise based metrics when we're actually able to capture the rate of components that convert to the uh, two components. Uh, oops, sorry. And then all it was the metric where we're actually able to get um, capture the behaviors of the actual components, right? So somehow like the combinations of the foreign noise based metrics and all it was the metric give us a better picture about the components outside and inside the areas of the two components. Right? In like we hope that we can have polynomial rate for the components uh, comparing to like uh, the, the rate one of a block n that we have from the water time metric that uh, we have earlier. And then the second direction is like how can we use how can we develop the hierarchical version of all the water time metric uh, to understand the contraction behaviors of the missing measures in the hierarchical models, like the hierarchical Richter process or like the LDA. And final direction is like, uh, because the commutation right now we have for the all process metric is quadratic, right? In terms of normal components, we also hope to develop some version of that metrics that only have linear in terms of like normal components, because it means that if we want to perform like model selection, right, perform like how we, from how we choose number components, we also hope that we can compute that distance very fast right, in high dimension, right? And it's also the hope that we can develop some slight version of all the system metric such that we can compute that one in linear time in terms of like number components, such that we can use one in the high dimension settings of the digital approximation models. And that's also everything that I have to talk today. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Um, so there's uh, there's one question in the chat from Nicholas Irons. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you want to unmute yourself, Nicholas, or I'm happy to to read it out. Oh. Yeah, uh, let me take go back to his question. So basically, our uh, question is about like the block, right? Yeah. yeah. So the question really uh, is why why you get this particular um, yeah. kind of a structure dense structure on the left. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so for, uh, for the left-hand side block, right? Because 
we use the entropic Lebesgue vector, right? We have the entropic realization, right? And we have that one divided by uh, lambda times the entropy, right? And because we have that entropy here, it's been that we don't want the, the values, right? The weight actually, I mean, the values of nu, right? Go zero, right? That's why like, uh, if we actually use the entropic uh, regularization over there, then it's implied that the plan, I mean, the, the plan for like the uh, actually dense because the value can be can be zero, right? I mean, actually, in practice, it actually can be uh, like uh, not actually it's not small, right? That depends on the values of the uh, lambda, right? Because this is the penalty we have, right? When we actually uh, regularize the what's the metric, but then yes. for the right so, hand side, uh, yeah. So basic, but like as your regularization uh, penalty mm -hmm. goes to zero, you should expect the yeah transport the optimal Wasserstein transport plan to look something like more on the right. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. But uh, it, okay. Point, like, so this plot is just well, kind of a function of like the specific penalty you're using, right? So I don't know if that yeah. really shows that you're yeah. like capturing the behavior. Uh, I think the core things is like uh, the local uh, plan. Like if you, you see that, uh, if you see the right hand side, right, with the exponential function, we see we do see the three somehow like somehow like the diagonal thing, right? But like we do see like the kind of like group behavior, like uh, one we have three group, right? Somehow two groups, right? One for like uh, when you match like some components of the red curve to the blue curve, right? And another one, when I mean, the second one also like let's say we match the middle one of the red curve to the middle one of like blue curve, and then the final one somehow at the final mod line of the red curve to the uh, blue curve. And we also have like- Yeah, but I, I guess my that. point is, what I'm the point I'm trying to make is that you're trying to compare the Wasserstein and the Orlik Wasserstein. And obviously mm -hmm. you have to use the, an approximation using the entropic regularization. But the point mm -hmm. is that if you had actually computed the true Wasserstein optimal transport plan, it wouldn't look anything like the thing you have on the left, right? It would look like a monotone transport yeah, plan. So I just, it seems like it's not really a fair yeah. comparison here. Um, mm, yeah, I think I, 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 I mean, I agree with your point, yeah. But I just want to say like, because we just want to mention some of the effect of using exponential function fee, right? On the, uh, on the, what's the metric, right? It means that we allow to eliminate a lot of like extra components, right? Basically, like you see on the, up, up the diagonals, because we exponential, then it tend to actually uh, decay very fast to zero, right? That's actually, I mean, I mean, I mean if we ignore about the effect of lambda, just want to talk about like the effects of like uh, L2 norm in w, W1 matrix and exponential function, right? I, I mentioned for the exponential function, I'll go back to that. Then we have that bound, right? That bound over there. So I mean like for the extra uh, weight, right? I mean the weight is actually outside the diagonal then we have that exponential over there. So somehow it decay faster than the nodes from uh, L2. So that's the point. That's why like, uh, the plot here can be a bit confusing, but my point here, like we try to demonstrate that even by using the same lambda for two methods, then the exponential fee tend to give like fast decay of like extra components comparing to like the standard or standard metric. But I agree that like, if we actually use exact value of the one, then it's better. Okay, thank you. Great talk. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, so are there other questions? Um, so maybe I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I was uh, uh, wondering about this uh, Orlitz uh, nor uh, vaster mm -hmm. distance because uh, I'm not really familiar with it. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, in a problem where the um, convergent rate of um, standard Wasserstein distance would be parametric, so for example, empirical distribution to a univariate uh, density, oh. um, how would the choice of uh, phi impact the rate? I mean, like when you estimate like the uh, the univariate, right? Yes. You mentioned an empirical one. Yeah, I mean. For the empirical one, what's the metric, right? We have we know that it's actually biometric rate, right? Yes. Especially the, but then for the Olix, actually it's a very good point. We somehow show that it's not biometric, right? And yeah. it depends. No, it's actually it actually depends on the choice of fee. 
Like for example, like um, we actually haven't finished the proof yet, but uh, somehow we say that uh, it depends on like the nature of phi. So let's say if phi is a polynomial in our case, then we still have parametric, right? But then when phi become exponential in all symmetric, then the rate can be only become polynomial, but not precisely the uh, parametric, right? Um, so basically, not uh, we pay we pay a little bit for the uh, for the estimation of the uh, uh, empirical uh, distribution uh, of the data, but uh, mm -hmm. but the core point. I, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, but but the core point I want to mention here, like uh, the reason we use all it because we want to capture the extra components, right? We want to get the tie rate for the extra components, but mm -hmm. not the tie rate for the whole thing, right? We only want to demonstrate that in fact. Uh, we can get uh, a better and better behaviors, a better rate of the extra components by using all it, by using the proper choice of the fee. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we may not get the exact rate for the like other one because we have slow rate, right? For in terms of like uh, using all it. But so, we can use combination. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, sorry, sorry. Just to understand. So basically, uh, even the choice of an exponential fee. For some mm -hmm. problems, it could lead to faster rates, and for others, it could lead to slower the rates. Slower, yeah. Okay. Be not, yeah, it, exactly. That's why you need to actually uh, investigate carefully which problem that we have benefit. For some of like in Mitchell model, we know that it can be useful to capture the rates of the edge components. That's why we use that one for that, right? But for the estimation of the problem you mentioned, we estimate the uh, distribution, right? By the impure distribution in 1D, in one dimension, then Perhaps it's not useful to use uh, all the the magic. I mean, sorry, it's not useful to use exponential function for fee because you lose the uh, statistical accuracy. Uh, it's been that uh, we need to be careful. So I guess, uh, in my opinion, that uh, all the the magic is useful for capturing the extra components in like in the infinite uh, uh, mixture models. Like if you have when you have uh, so many extra components and you want to get the precise behaviors of the components, then you can use exponential function for fee, right? But in general, if you want only think about like uh like estimation of the nested function or like uh, distribution, then it may not be the good choice to use the, the, the exponential function. Right? It's good for capturing the latent structure, but not for the distribution estimation. Okay. Yeah. And so Just straight up over there. The yeah. fact that uh, so the fact that the rate was logarithmic um, yeah. inspired the choice of exponential function, or it doesn't uh, have anything to do with yeah, the actually, exponential it, function. It it does right. Like if you see theorem three, right? So basically, like in like uh, in the like in two in two i over there, we see that the rate of extra components the exponential right of the log n to the one eight right. But if we actually use like the uh, second order what's the metric, then this basically just like the uh the square, right? Not the exponential of that uh, log n one to one eight. So the reason we use exponential because it can somehow apply to that log n to one eight, right? And get back to polynomial rates. Right? Exponential of log n to the one eight is polynomial, right? Uh and this is actually motivation because we want to improve the uh, the rate for the extra components in 2i, right? Comparing to like, when we use only the standard, um, standard, the, uh, no, standards like L2 norm uh, from the Austin metric. But then that, and the cost that we pay for the rate of the mixing measure in one, in i, right? Because now for the i, the mixing measure rate only one divided by log n to one eight, right? And the, and the one we have to get from the, uh, Euclidean was the metric is one divided by log n to one half. Right? So actually it's lower under yeah. exponential, right? Yeah. But okay. uh, but the one faster is the the extra components. Yeah. <clears throat> because now, yeah. That's why I, I mentioned right, it, it depends on the, the purpose, right? Because now we, we, we try to get a better pictures about the contractions of the extra components. That's why we use exponential function for like the uh all equals the metric. But if, if, let's say if you want to capture the rate for the um, like the rate for the uh, uh, only the rate for the uh, two components, let's say, then we should not use uh, exponential. We ought to use like uh, Euclidean. 
Okay. So it means that uh, in practice, we should uh, combine all the uh, exponential and Euclidean with alternate between them somehow to get better picture about the, the race of parameters. Is, is it clear? Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's not very clear from the top, but like, basically you mean that in practice, we should uh, vary the choice of all the metric with the norm, right? Uh, the choice of like the, the fee function of fee, just that we depends on it, right? If we want to get the rate for the um for the uh, extra components, we exponential. If we want to get the rate for the two components, we may get we may stick to using the the standard polynomial function, right? So it means like it depends on the purpose that we want. Yeah, yeah. Yes, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Mata. So, are there other questions? Okay, so uh, may I, uh, sorry, may I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, maybe maybe this is a naive thought. So do you think like if you change the uh Watson's matrix to the Alice Watson's matrix, it will also have impact of the coverage and also credible intervals for your estimation? Because here, uh, as you talk, you uh, you focus on the rate, right? Mm -hmm. That's but actually if, a good question. Uh, good question. So when you say the coverage, uh. A common interval, right? Let's yes. say you mean like for parameters or like for the density estimation. Uh, or... I think uh, I think both. So maybe density oh. estimation is more interesting. For density estimation, if we A we see right, actually Bay you have one right. So it means that uh, I I believe that the common interval can be wider, right? Comparing yeah. to the standard what's the metric. But again, I mentioned uh, it depends on. I mean, we we need to understand the. The purpose, right? When we use that uh, all equation metric, so for example, like here, I we try to get better picture about the extra components. That's why we use that to understand the interaction of the extra component, right? Mm -hmm. But then, if we want to build the common intervals, I suggest that we just use L two norm, right? Let's say it's actually uh, better. I mean, if we actually use L two norm for this estimation, then we just stick to like uh, using the order was that metric. You know, it's actually have better better result than using the all equation metric. Yeah. yeah, that's what but I then, thought. Uh, yeah. But then again, if you look at that, when I mentioned that we have Vx to be exponential x squared minus 1, if that's actually correct, I mentioned here, then it's been that we still, still have a choice uh, of exponential function that comparable to the one we have from second second norm, what's it, mm -hmm. Euclidean norm, what's the metric. Right? But that one actually very hard to prove. But if it's correct, then it's been that we can use that exponential x squared over there uh, to actually compensate for that. But again, we don't know if it's correct or not. It's just our conjecture. Mm, I see. Thanks. And also, I have Thanks. a very small question. So, um, mm. for example, on the slides of thirty-seven, so just one page before this one, yeah. so I can see like yeah. there's uh, uh on the last slide. So you you have like theta j minus theta i not instead of theta j. Is that a typo or is that is actually theta i that I missed something? I think that j over there. like oh. a page and stuff. Yeah. I think the chase means like uh, we consider on uh, components far away from the two components. Ah, right? so okay. Let's say we have, yeah, right. That's why we say the extra component, right? Because they're far away from these and they have small weight. Because, like, when you fit, like, let's say, uh, 1,000 components to 10 components, right? You're going to have a lot of components outside, right? And they are yeah. very far away from the real, real one. And we want to see, like, how the components, how even they're very far away from the real the two components, how they contract, how they actually, how, how their weight actually goes zero. So the one we have for most of the metrics saying that the way of these guys go to zero at the one at the block end, right? Mm. But then the all explicitly say no, it's actually go at the rate of polynomial, right? So basically it means a huge improvement because now if you perform model selection, you try to remove this uh, component, right? Then mm. you you actually uh, re uh, reduce from one at the block end to polynomial. So we need much less sample. Must less sample, right? In order to detect these small weights, right? Comparing to like uh, using uh, like the Euclidean or the metric, that's a, that's a, that's a main idea here. Oh, okay. Um, yes. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions? Okay. So I think I'll call it a day then. So yeah. uh, thanks again to uh, Inha for mm -hmm. a very interesting talk. And yeah. we have another Thanks, talk Jim, yeah. uh, in December. Okay. Thank Jim for for inviting me. And thanks everyone for coming. Okay. Bye bye everyone. Bye. Thanks, Nyat. Bye. bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah.